Good morning, everybody. It's Pastor Tom welcoming you to another study in the Word. I suppose it's morning here, maybe it's afternoon where you're at, or maybe even evening, but thank you for joining me, and please subscribe, if you will, to our channel. We appreciate when you do that, and if you like like us, give us a thumbs up, and we uh, appreciate that. Also, share this video if it uh, if if uh, you enjoy or watching them. That's how they get around, and I appreciate it very much. Today, we're going to do our fifth uh, session, I believe it is, in Ephesians, verse by verse, and we're, we're going to start in, in chapter 3, so if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Ephesians chapter, or excuse me, Ephesians, Colossians chapter 3, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry, Colossians chapter 3, and this will be our fifth session in Colossians, and a very great chapter here that we're going to go through, one of my favorite chapters, and uh, making good progress. In verse 1, it says, therefore... If you have been raised up with Christ, it's asking a question now, keep seeking the things above. Now, I'm reading to you uh, today uh, uh, out of the uh, New American Standard Bible. Just so you know, it's a little different maybe than the King James or New King James. I'm using it simply because I've never used it before. I like it for the simplicity of uh, what I'm doing here. So, uh, that's why. But... He asks a question. Therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ, and of course, he in the in the chapters before he talked about that. The truth of the matter is, we have already been raised up to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Well, Pastor Tom, how is that possible? I mean, we're here, but that yet we're there. Well, that's the uh, something that that uh, uh, we just have to take by faith. It is something that uh, that only. Almighty God could uh, commission, but you have to understand the kingdom of God does not run on the same principles, even uh, in the natural. As an example, we have gravity, but the kingdom of God doesn't necessarily have to run on gravity here on earth. Uh, you know, time and space and distance and all that kind of thing that we have, uh, as a, it's a blessing to us down here on earth. Uh, but uh, the kingdom of God or uh, God's kingdom does not uh, have the same type of uh, laws, physical laws and stuff that rule the un that, that this part of the universe only uh, here on earth. And so when God says these things, he's saying them from the standpoint of heaven and uh, the standpoint of the kingdom and the standpoint of what is possible. And he goes on and says, therefore, if you are, have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Now, have you ever heard anybody say this? You know, don't be so heavenly minded that you're not earthly good. You know, no earthly good. I hear people say that sometimes, and it's, it's a jab or a shot at somebody who maybe prays a lot or somebody who uh, just, just loves God so much that all they can talk about is the things of God, and it seems like they never come back down to earth. And I think that sometimes we do need to come back down to earth a little bit. But really, basically, he's, he's telling us here that the wise person sets their mind on the things above and not on the things down here. So we are called to that. And it's, uh, it is uh, uh, true that we can be uh, heavenly minded, but never is it true that we can be no earthly good. The more heavenly minded we are, the more earthly good we will be. And so it's always remember that. Set your mind on these things above, not on the things on the earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Really interesting. The terms used here are all covenant terms. You know, whenever you read the Bible, it's a covenant book. And when Jesus died, he cut covenant. It was the great blood covenant, the last one that was necessary between God and man. It used to be that God would cut covenant with animals and all that. The blood was pointing to Jesus, and uh, then it would give God a legal right to do certain things in the earth because of man's fall. Uh, Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, the first thing when they sinned, he put a, uh, an animal over them, remember that skin and the blood, the skin was a, the Adamic covenant, gave, gave them at least uh, the ability to, to uh, again, have uh, some kind of contact with the Lord, so on. Okay, so 
this blood covenant, when Jesus died, he died as all God, all man, and one man, cutting that covenant, bridging the gap. And so it says that when he died, we died. In, in Colossians, we'll see that in, 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 in uh, we saw it in the last uh, uh, chapter. And when we, he was raised from the dead, we were raised from the dead in the mind of God now. And he says, because of that, your life is hidden with God in Christ. So our lives are not our own. We're bought with a price. They're, they're hidden with God. And we need to understand that, that this is what covenant is. This is what he did for us. For, verse 3. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you will also will be uh, revealed with him in glory. Very interesting scripture here. I want to sit, stop. You know, sometimes we run over this stuff, and it's like, all right, you know, just move on to the next verse. But I want you to think about what he's saying here. He says, when Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. There's a, probably a, a two or three ways you can look at this, and all of them would be true. Number one, when the life of Jesus Christ is revealed in the earth, in a person, then we also will be re revealed with him. And how will that happen? In his glory, or his glory will begin to reveal itself. Also, you could look at it and say, when Jesus Christ, who is our life, is revealed when he comes back, then you also will be revealed with him in glory, which means we are not what we seem to be right now. We're going to be like him. When we see him, we're going to be, realize all of a sudden, you know, at the rapture of the church, that we're like him, that we are this, this new creation, this, this awesome being that God created to have fellowship with. And, you know, when man was created, it really ticked the devil off because the devil wanted to be the one who had that authority. And the devil wanted to have that relationship with God. But uh, God, when he created man, that's, uh, that's why Satan got jealous and went after him and uh, lost his position. Is because man was created a higher being than the angels, you know, in the image and likeness of God. Angels are not in the image and likeness of God. Angels are created beings, yes, they're powerful beings, yes, but nothing like man. That's why the Bible says that the angels really can't understand uh, totally the salvation that we, we experience because they don't have that. Um, though they work for God, though they understand some things. And so here he says in verse 5, Therefore, or because of that fact, consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality, impurity, all right, passion, evil desire, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. So this is interesting because he, he begins to compare something here. When people do things with their body that are immoral, or impure, or uh, they actually get uh, uh, released somehow in, in, a, in a bad way with passion and evil desire and greed, it amounts to, in God's eyes, idolatry. In other words, we are then positioning ourselves to where we're worshiping other gods. We're worshiping our own bodies. We're worshiping uh, the pleasure that that sin can give us. And this is something that we need to understand and we need to repent of and we need to ask God to forgive us and, and, and realize that that's how, how dangerous that is. Verse 6, For it is because of these things that the wrath of God will come upon the sons of disobedience. It's because of those things that the wrath of God will be released on those who are not believers. And so there will be a sober, sober thought. We don't want to be involved in the things that are caused the wrath of God to be released on this world. And uh, those things, those things like that will draw that wrath. And this anger of God is angry against it because sin was the thing that destroyed human beings, destroyed a relationship with uh, uh, their creator. And sin's a very powerful thing. And, and so God is 
is is um, wanting us to be separate, separate ourselves away from that. Verse 7. And in them you also once walked when you were living in them. Actually, all of us came out of that where we actually lived in those passions and those impurities and those things. And he says, you came out of that, but now you also put them all aside. And then he goes on and, and explains some more. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive speech from your mouth. So he kind of deals with all these different areas where you get into trouble. Goes to uh, verse 9. Do not lie to one another since you laid aside the old self with its evil practices. And again, uh, then verse 10. And having put on the new self or the new man who is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. Wow. A renewal in which there is no distinction between Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, and free man, but Christ is all and in all. So here's the wonderful thing about this covenant. God says, look, since you're in the covenant, you're part of Christ, lay aside the old ways Lay aside the sin and put on the new man, the new self, the new creation man. If any person be in Christ, they are a new creation. All things have passed away. All things becomes new. And so he says, yield to that. Yield to that new man and who is created and is, is renewed daily. Okay? And then he goes on and says, there's no distinction between the Greek, between the Jew, between any nationality. Hallelujah. You're just one in Christ. Now, right there, that should put a real dent in any kind of thinking of racism. Because as far as God's concerned, the outside part of man is not the real him anyway. That's just a house that he lives in. And the inside, we all look the same. We're all spirits. We're all created in the image and likeness of God. And when we become new creations, uh, we, he, he does it for us all together the same. So we accept us. There is no such thing as a white church or a black church or a Hispanic church in God's mind. There's no such thing as that. There's no such thing as a Greek Orthodox church or a, you know, a Roman Catholic church or any other that kind of nonsense. It, it, it is new creation. You're either in or you're not. You're either a new species or you're not. And this is what the Bible teaches. So we need to think that way. All right, get the other stuff out of your mind. Verse 12. So as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Wow. Bearing with one another and forgiving one another. Whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also you should forgive yourself. Beyond all these things, Put on love. This agape love is the most powerful force in the universe. He says, above all these things, put on love, right? Which is the perfect bond of unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts to which indeed you were called in one body and be thankful. So there's a lot said in these verses. First of all, he says, we are to let the peace of Christ rule in our hearts. This is very important to understand. In the day and age we're living in, we need to have that peace. We need to set our affections on the things on high. We need to get up every morning and focus on the good things of God. And we need, as the body of Christ, to have that peace. There's something about peace that you can't fake. When you get around somebody that's at peace, <clears throat> it's an amazing thing because <clears throat> there's a, an undisturbedness about them that no matter what takes place or what they're seeing or somebody's saying this or the news is saying that, it doesn't seem to shake them much. You say, why? Because they have that supernatural, the peace of God that passes all understanding, is supernatural peace, and it's to be ruling in our hearts. That is the thing that needs to be ruling in our heart is peace. Peace needs to be ruling in our hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body and be thankful. We ought to be very thankful that God has given us peace, especially down here in this not-so-hot world right now, this, this hard, difficult place to live in. 
and and what we're going through sometimes you know you need that peace you need you need that joy don't you and then it goes on and says this this is how you do it let the word of christ richly dwell within you and with all wisdom teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs singing with thankfulness in your heart to god Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks through him to God the Father. Now I'm going to stop here because this, to me, is very important. He's basically in this chapter, in the last few verses anyway, telling us how our spiritual life should be and what things we should be participating in so that our spiritual life will affect all parts of our life. And it goes on and says, number one, we've got to learn how to let that peace rule. Well, how do we do that? Well, he explains it. He says, what you have to do is you've got to let the word of Christ richly or dwell within you richly. All right? And do it with all wisdom, with all teaching, and admonishing one another. So, in other words, we're going to have to get the word of God in us. It's, we got, we're going to get the wisdom of God because the wisdom of God comes out of the word of God by teaching and admonishing one another. This is one another with what? Psalms, with hymns, with spiritual songs, seeking with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Now, if you come from a denominational background, and I mentioned to you psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, immediately your mind may go to the hymnal or a book that you have of hymns and songs that somebody wrote over the years and that when you go to church, they say, turn to that and we're going to sing that song. Well, okay, that's one form of that because simply some of those songs, and some of them aren't any good at all, but many of them are, came uh, as a result of inspiration from God. And so it's okay to sing that. It's okay to sing worship songs that have or have been anointed by God over the years. Nothing wrong with that. But really what he's getting at here is what I call prophetic music, prophetic praise and worship, where in our own division, uh, <clears throat> devotions, and you'd have to go to Ephesians. Ephesians covered that where, you know, uh, 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 you know, doing this to yourself in Psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Here he's saying to one another, and so you, you, you're doing it all the time. You're doing it at home where you're praising God and worshiping God, especially in other tongues and in the spirit. As you're going along, you're singing. Sometimes maybe you, excuse me for a minute. As you're going along, maybe even for a minute, you, you stop and you, and you get an interpretation of what you were singing and you sing it in the natural you go from the spirit to the natural, to the natural, to the spirit, singing spiritual songs, hymns, singing these things, you know, and God gives them to you, worship songs, you begin to praise God, you get caught up in the spirit. This is what he's talking about. And he says, as we're, because we're spiritual beings, when we do that, we do it at home, we bring it over into the services, we have these things begin to manifest like this. Sometimes it happens more than other times, but when it does happen, it is, brings a heavenly glow. It brings something from heaven because heaven then becomes <clears throat> in charge of the particular service or in charge of your life. People ask me all the time, how do you learn how to be led by the Spirit of God? Well, one of the ways is by participating in what he's talking about here, psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Very important. And as you do that, you get sensitive to what he's doing and saying and what he's, uh, and there's teaching in it. There's admonishing in it. There's powerful things that come out of that. And as you do that, you become more and more sensitive to the Lord so that when you go into a service, as an example, you can participate with the other saints. All of us should be doing this together so that we could hit that place. Now, what happens? Well, I could tell you story after story after story in my own particular life and ministry about how when the congregation either my congregation or congregation where I was visiting. And we begin to do that. We begin to have these spiritual songs, these heavenly songs, these gifts of the Spirit in operation in, psalm, in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, tongues and interpretation and singing and uh, prophecy and all that. When that began to happen, it's like there's a dimension of God that comes in the room 
many times that is not. It's a higher dimension. It's, uh, I like to say, it's the glory of God begins to manifest. It rolls in. The tangible presence of God, which is different than just the normal uh, presence of God. It's much deeper, much stronger, and God is involved in what we're doing. Everything that we are doing is being led by God. And when that happens, you're liable to have some of the most uh, wonderful things happen. In that glory, I have seen, when we started doing that, I have seen in my particular life, right before my eyes, I have seen blind eyes open from deaf. I have seen deaf ears open. Some people didn't have eardrums. I have seen, this is me personally, I have watched and seen cripples uh, rise up and walk off. I have seen uh, just uh, amazing things. People get new body parts. Uh, people who could not have babies, all of a sudden uh, their their uh, fallopian tubes or whatever it was that was was off uh, were, were were put back right, and they ended up having children. We could go down such a long list of the healings and the deliverances from demon power that come from the glory coming in. But the first step in the glory coming in is allowing the glory to have control. And the way that that happens in our lives is, and he's telling us this, through psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, and uh, making melody in our hearts to the Lord. Now, hold your place in Colossians. We'll be right back there. But let's go over to Ephesians. Excuse me, because <clears throat> we want to see it there. Ephesians chapter 5, I believe. And I want to read this to you so we can get the full picture here. And it's, it's one of the most amazing things when you learn about this. And you understand that the the worship service, our Christianity, is is much different. The way God de desires it to be is much different than most people's. You begin to get excited because you find out there's a whole other dimension out here that we're not walking. Now, in Ephesians chapter 5, if you look down here at verse, let me see here. Uh, let's go ahead and, and uh, start. Let's just start. At verse um, 14, for this reason, it says, Awake, sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. And then it goes on and says, Therefore, be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, <clears throat> but as wise, making the most of your time, because the days are evil. So then do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Well, what's the will of the Lord? Do not be drunk with wine, for that is dispensation. You're going to have problems when you do that. But be filled with the Spirit. And in the Greek it says, be continually filled with the Spirit. What happens when we're continually filled with the Spirit? Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns, and there it is again, as spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord. Always giving thanks for all things. Basically, those two scriptures are almost alike, aren't they? Almost the same. Hallelujah. And so we see here that God is telling us the way the Lord is, is that. And when you get there, then God can communicate with you about the rest of your life. And people don't realize that. Most people, they say, well, God's going to speak to me, you know, and I'm just going to sit there and listen, and the little, little voice is going to speak to me. But God wants us to participate. And he wants us to worship him and participate in this. And this, and then he starts giving us these psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. And we come, we get to a place of, how should I put this? Well, you get to a place where you are totally in tune, totally tuned with heaven. You're actually, you're, you're participating in the heavenly realm of worship. You're, 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 you're in the spirit. This is what, what the Bible talks about, about being in the Spirit, pray in the Spirit. And, and when you're in the Spirit, you're not in the natural. And so you are partaking there, you can partake of spiritual things. And you just grow into your relationship with the Lord and hearing Him. And you know when He speaks. Hallelujah. So this becomes extremely important. And I remember when I first got saved, um, and filled with the Holy Spirit, and I had that 33 days where I was in the presence of the Lord, and uh, 30 days, the glory filled my house, and I, I tell that story 
and it was amazing. And I, and looking back on it, I half the stuff I was doing I didn't understand, but I, but I just was caught up. And you know, if you get caught up in the spirit, and you allow God to just use you, you'll you'll do things you never thought possible. I mean, it's just, and I did. One of the things I was doing was singing, okay, and worship songs, singing in tongues, and then interpreting it. And I didn't even know that. I didn't even know what interpretation was at that time. I knew nothing about any of that, but that's what I was doing. Found out later. And God would give me psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in my heart to the Lord. The more I did that, the more I kindled the fire of God on the inside of me, the more there was, you know, where there's fire, there's smoke, the more the glory would fill the room. And as we begin to do that individually and as a body of Christ, that glory begins to come out of us and fill the room. It's not that God comes down out of heaven somehow. It's more he comes out of his people, his temple. And he begins to fill us. And he does, begins to, to, to visit us and manifest amongst us. And he, he teaches us and gives us revelation and wisdom and joy and power, all the things that we want, healings and deliverances. This is the way it works. So verse 16, again, of Colossians, let the word of Christ richly dwell within you. The more words you have in you, the more you're going to be used prophetically. It's prophecy or tongues and interpretation, which equals prophecy, or words of wisdom, any of that, all has to be and, and is lined up with the Word of God. The Word of God is the final say. The Word of God, the living Word of God, is how we judge things. You don't go outside the Word of God. So as you get more and more word in you, the more he can explain your abilities in this area. So he says, let the word of Christ dwell within you richly. That's the first thing. With all wisdom, teaching, and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns, spiritual songs, praise God. Singing with thanksgiving to your hearts to God. Again, I want to remind you, we need to be thankful, right? And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him, to God the Father. Amen. Tremendous. Now, the next verse, he goes on, verse 18, he says, wives. Interesting. Now, what's happening here? Well, in context, he's telling us how we live our lives. When you stay filled with the Holy Spirit, when you're, when you're operating over here in this dimension, then it will begin to affect our family life. It will begin to affect our work life, our natural life in every single way, and we can be, it will pour over into that. And we can then live the way that God intended us to live in our families. You see, Christian families should be different. Not wacky, not but you know legalistic and bizarre. It's, I, sometimes I, I think people try to push things too far. He's not saying you can't go to a ball game or you can't play sports or any of that kind of stuff. But we should look different. And what should be different about us is the holiness. And what should, when people look at our family units, really, quite frankly, they should get the fear of God on them. Because when you're a spiritual person and you have a group of people that it's the first, it's the first cell of the church. I mean, you got a group of family that is really filled with the Holy Ghost operating in these things. you got something amazing to look at. And that's what the world needs to see. The world needs to see that right now. They need to see families that are real families and being run the way God intended. Real, real businesses that are being run the way God intended. Real, and he's going to go on and talk about some of these things. But we run out of time <laughs> in this session, so we'll have to wait till next session to get into that. But I just want to let you know we love you, appreciate you. Listen, if you would, please subscribe. And also, if you feel led, down below there is a link, and you can go over to our website, and you can become a partner with us, and just say, you know, I'd like to become a partner with you. And many people are doing that, and, and, and uh, they're praying for us. We appreciate it so much. Thank you for your prayers. Also, not only are they praying for us, they're supporting us financially, and thank you very much for that. The more money comes in, the more we can do for God. And we are a soul-winning organization. We are not the largest ministry in the world today. We're not. 
We don't have the most influence in the world. But I can tell you this, for what we do, I don't know anybody else, uh, maybe there is, but we, we are excellent at what we do, and we are constantly winning souls, bearing fruit, seeing people saved, healed, filled with the Holy Spirit, delivered. It is a, it, it is, it was precise like a laser beam. And so if you want to support something that is doing something and, and, and lifting up and glorifying the Lord Jesus, we would appreciate you doing so, becoming part of our family, part of this end times army. Well, until next time, this is Pastor Tom. Remember this, feed your faith, starve your doubts to death. Till next time, God bless you.